Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John and today we've got a video deck primer on a brand new CDH deck. To cap off Tamer Month, which we started with Cobblepot's incredibly unique deck with Kark Thrasios Clown Car, I have a list to present today that's built using some of the cards out of the Doctor Who set from late last year. Now the original idea for this deck is one that I have to credit to Comedian MTG, one of the Mind Sculptors, when he pointed out that you can do a lot of really interesting things with the Doctor's Companion K9 Mark I. And I also have to say a big shout out to Kai the Fervent Alchemist and Surreal for giving me a lot of help and advice in how I was tuning this deck. If you want to see their takes on this list, Kai did a list called Full Metal Alchemist, and Surreal did a list, Dr. Rogdog, which you can find down in the description for this episode. But before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us again. If you're enjoying the stuff that we're doing over here now as part of CCO Media Group, be sure to let us know in the comments down below. Be sure to like and subscribe, and if you want to get on the discussion, you can join us over on the Commander Cookout Patreon Discord. Now we're going to have a lot to cover in a relatively short amount of time, so without further ado, let me explain and introduce our commanders. This is going to be a very commander-centric deck, although not necessarily in the way you may be expecting or be used to. What our commanders provide is a lot of early game redundancy and power. For the most part, we don't really need our commanders on the field for our deck to function, but our deck's game plan is going to utilize our commanders in such a way that it smooths things out. We're not really doing anything unique or revolutionary in terms of teamers' strategies with either the mid-range grind or classic win conditions, but our choice of commanders do change the way that we are able to approach the game. We're taking advantage of a Doctor and a Doctor's Companion for our deck. Our Doctor's Companion will be K9 Mark I, a single blue mana for a 1-1 legendary artifact creature robot dog with Doctor's Companion, and as long as K9 Mark I is untapped, other legendary creatures you control have Ward 1, and 1 blue tap. Target legendary creature can't be blocked this turn. It's going to be our Doctor's Companion who is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting in the early game for our deck. As a one mana value creature, this goodest boy turns on Mox Amber, Deflecting Swat, Fierce Guardianship, and Springleaf Drum. And as a one mana value creature, Neoform turns it into a Dockside Extortionist. As a one mana value artifact, K9 provides two thirds of the Metalcraft for Mox Opal, and Transmute Artifact can turn it into the one ring if you have another three mana kicking around. A critical mass of turn 1 acceleration usually means that this deck is well positioned to be threatening wins as early as turn 3. And we are running several very big mana value engines that we are going to use to grind out the mid game if we need to while we're waiting for our window to open. In addition, K9 does provide the Doctor a little bit of ward for extra protection and a little bit of evasion. Neither one of which is super critical to our game plan, but they're nice incidental benefits. The Doctor, who we'll be pairing K9 with, will be the Fugitive Doctor. Three red and a green for a 4-4 legendary creature Time Lord Doctor, with, when the Fugitive Doctor enters the battlefield, investigate. And, whenever the Fugitive Doctor attacks, you may sacrifice a clue. When you do, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback to red green. Well, it's the only option that we have to make a teamer Doctor Who deck if we have a blue Doctor's Companion, so here we are. Our Doctor does provide us an outlet for infinite mana when we are able to cast it and recast it an infinite number of times to create an infinite number of clues. We can then spend that infinite mana to be able to draw every card in our deck or as much of our deck as we need to to force our win through. The other nice part is that while we're not leaning too heavily on the triggered attack ability, it does offer some really unique lines that we cannot do in any other deck in Teamer. Where, for example, we can use Neoform on K9 to get Dockside Extortionist, then have the Fugitive Doctor attack giving Neoform flashback. Spend two red green 
and then neoform the fugitive doctor into a dead eye navigator and begin a combo in the post combat main phase to win the game i mean at first blush this fugitive doctor does kind of have the kess at home feeling to it but again we are primarily using it as an outlet as well as a way to potentially neoform or eldritch evolution into a more critical piece of our strategy it's that ETB that is the most important part of our Doctor. As far as the deck itself is concerned, it does pivot reasonably well between going for the fast win or trying to grind out value in the mid-range game. Compared to Grixis shells, we do lose access to some of the fastest rituals in the game. We don't have your Dark Ritual, Cabal Ritual, or Calling the Weak, which really can't be ignored. We did talk about this last time when we did our episode on Teamer in CDH and Beyond. You can check out that video up here. What we gain in exchange by trading out black for green is a little bit more stability with our mana production. As we had talked about before, we do gain access through green to a little bit more stable mana in the form of cards like Carpet of Flowers or Birds of Paradise, as well as some additional rituals in the form of Elvish Spirit Guide and Tinderwall. Carpet of Flowers and Birds of Paradise are undoubtedly slower than those best black rituals, but the ability to get some advantage turn over turn is pretty nice. And they do allow us to get some very powerful plays going as early as turn two. When playing the deck, our early game priorities are going to be to mulligan for early action. We have an outlet in the command zone and an enabler in the form of K9 but we don't have reliable card advantage coming from it. You'd never really want to depend on sacrificing a clue off the Fugitive Doctor as your long-term card draw option. If you have a hand that can win fast, great. Go for it. Otherwise, you want a hand that can land an early card advantage engine, something like Ristic Study, Mystic Remora, Sylvan Library, something like that. We are also on cards like Ledger Shredder and Malcolm Alluring Scoundrel as other two drop value engines. And of course, we're a CDH deck, so in this modern era, we are running the One Ring. If you can comfortably get ahead on mana on turn one, you can usually very comfortably play out a powerful card draw engine on turn two, while still having some mana to spare to threaten one mana interaction with your opponents. In most of our opening hands, K9 Mark 1 is a very important piece of the puzzle. K9 will activate a number of mana sources, which will put us farther ahead on turn 2. K9 also turns on the best free if you control a commander spells in the form of Deflecting Swat and Fierce Guardianship, which can be used to protect our own early win attempts, or police the table if someone else is going to go for it first. Having K9 on board also means that our most important tutors are alive straight out of the gate. Neoform is a top deck that scores us Dockside Extortionist, or lets us pivot if needed into a value engine like Ledger Shredder or Malcolm. I would usually, in most cases, prioritize Ledger Shredder over Malcolm. I don't really feel as comfortable with a one toughness creature in the world that Orcish Bowmasters is running right now. However, don't overlook the possibility of using a Neoform to get a Phantasmal image off the back of your K9 Mark I. Just have it come into play as a copy of somebody else's Esper Sentinel. Or on a really creature light pod, maybe you're going to be copying somebody's Krom if they really powered it out early. Read the table, know your seat, know what role you're going to play, and know when your window is going to open. As we move from the early game into mid game, we have to assess our seat at the table and our role in the pod. If our window is open, we should be looking to convert our mana advantage into a win. But if our window is not yet open, and especially when someone else's window may be open, we really should be trying to grind out value and helping to oppose the person who is trying to win the game. When our roll of the table demands that we sculpt our hand to accrue advantage because we're stuck on police duty and it's not yet time to go for it, we want to spend our tutors on cards that are going to get us value. Don't be shy about getting that phantasmal image to copy an engine like Esper Sentinel or Talion Kindly Lord or Krom. We have a lot of ways to assemble our win, and even reassemble it if we already spent a Neoform. 
but particularly if we're pivoting into the mid-range game, we do not want to leave value on the table. See Cobblepot's discussion about breaking down functional fixedness in our episode on Krark Thrasio's Clown Car. This is not a deck that wins with only one specific line. Many roads lead to victory. And we can assemble our win even if we've already used a piece to advance our game plan earlier during play, thanks to that attack trigger on the Fugitive Doctor. Our deck also includes a small number of powerful top-end value creatures who have the potential to put you very far ahead of the rest of the table, and are extremely likely to create a window within the next turn cycle. Consecrated Sphinx can be played with a Neoform off the Fugitive Doctor, and Hullbreaker Horror can be played with an Eldritch Evolution off the Fugitive Doctor. The former is going to draw you a boatload of cards, and probably put you into a position where you can force the win through, where once you land Hullbreaker Horror, you are almost certainly controlling the board and dictating the tempo of the rest of the game. On the other hand, when our window is open, go for it. Opponents may tap out to develop their own game plan, or may have gone for it and been stopped. If our opponents are low on resources and they're indicating that they don't have the interaction ready to stop a Dockside Extortionist and a Repeater, our window's open. It's time to go for it. We can create our window if we have some backup. K9 makes it pretty easy to turn on free interaction, but just remember that if you're using Neoform or Eldritch Evolution, you are often going to be required to sacrifice our K9 as part of the cost to cast the spell, which means we will not have access to it when we try to go and defend that spell. On the other hand, we are also running Birthing Pod, which we do not need to sacrifice K9 to until the spell has already resolved, making it a lot easier to defend on the stack with those pieces of free interaction. Plan your window accordingly, and get ready to go for it. So how does this deck typically win the game? We're going to lean into classic lines from Gruul and Teemer, particularly with Dockside Extortionist. Green grants us access to Teemer Sabretooth, and Blue gets us Deadeye Navigator, both of which can really easily create scenarios where we are generating an unbounded amount of mana and having Dockside enter the battlefield an unbounded number of times. Note that our Dockside lines do require a certain threshold of artifacts or enchantments for our opponent's side of the board. They're usually trivial to achieve in almost any CDH pod, but be aware of them. Particularly if you are trying to go for a win very early, you may not be able to reach those thresholds. To be specific, Tamer Saber Tooth plus Dockside Extortionist is going to require a minimum of five artifacts and enchantments on your opponent's side of the board. That's one in a green to activate Teamer Sabretooth to return Dockside to your hand, one in a red to recast Dockside Extortionist, netting you one treasure token per loop. Dockside Extortionist plus Deadeye Navigator, on the other hand, has a threshold of only three artifacts or enchantments on your opponent's side of the board, as you are only going to need to pay one and a blue to use the activated ability on Deadeye Navigator to flicker Dockside, re-soul bond it, and generate an unbounded amount of mana that way. We are also running Cloudstone Curio in the list, and for Cloudstone Curio, we're going to have a minimum of three artifacts or enchantments, plus X, where X is the mana value of the non-artifact creature that we can cast to bounce Dockside and unbound a number of times. There is a serious discussion to be had as to whether or not this deck is optimized having Cloudstone Curio in it. We're currently on 20 creatures plus our two commanders, minus K9 and Spellskite being artifact creatures, so you can't use them to trigger the Cloudstone Curio effect. So that leaves us a total of 20 potential cards, or a fifth of our deck. I honestly don't think it'll be too hard to say that you control another creature or have another creature in hand to get this combo going, so I usually would say this is worth a slot in the deck. We will almost always be following this by casting the Fugitive Doctor, and then flickering, or bouncing, or recasting it an unbounded number of times to create an unbounded number of clues, which we will then crack to draw our deck, or as much of our deck is necessary to score a win. Now we are in Teamer, so we also have access to Underworld Breach, one of the single most powerful win conditions in all of CEDH. It would be a really good idea for us to include this and have ways to use it. Landing a breach often means that you will have access to all of the interaction you have already used in that game, and in the game of CDH, it's probably going to be a lot. 
it makes it very hard to stop somebody who has already landed a breach. This list isn't going to be on wheels. I don't think that's the right meta call right now with Orcish Bowmasters in every blacklist that can run it. But we are running our Brain Freeze and our Grinding Station as our enablers to set up the combo and get Underworld Breach going so we can get our entire library into the graveyard. With access to our entire deck, whether we have gotten that through unbounded numbers of ETBs with the Fugitive Doctor creating those clues, or whether we have gone off with Underworld Breach and Brain Freeze or Grinding Station to set everything we need up in our graveyard, it's time to actually close out the game. And our finishers are going to include options like Brain Freeze. Since we're already on Underworld Breach anyway, it's not that hard to, once we've cast an unbounded number of spells, target each of our opponents with a Brain Freeze and its unbounded number of copies to mill them out and end the game. There are a couple of lists still out there, like the Gitrog Monster, which can still be pretty comfortable with the entire deck in the graveyard, and may still in fact be running Eldrazi Titans to not be decked in that way. We also have the option of using Finale of Devastation, which is just by itself a fantastic tutor that we can use to set up our wins, but cast where X equals a ridiculously large number, it can easily end the game just through combat damage. Finally, we do run Lightning Bolt in the deck because it can go to face or can remove troublesome creatures. Eternal Witness, combined with one of our ETB reusers and an unbounded number of treasures, will allow us to take our opponents down one bolt at a time. And just a quick break to remind you that as part of CCO Media Group, Gemstone Mine Podcast is now sponsored by FusionGamingOnline.com, your source for all your gaming needs. I'm probably going to mention some cards in this deck that you may never have heard of. Maybe some that were printed before you were born and, oh god, I just made myself feel really, really, really old. But I can make myself feel young again by picking up cards from FusionGamingOnline.com. We have a brand new set coming out in Murders at Karlov Manor, which could have some potentially juicy stuff that's coming out. And it is new. It is hip, and it is definitely not old. That's FusionGamingOnline.com, your source for all your gaming needs. Now, I am going to include the deck list and primer in the link to this episode. You can check that in the description down below. But I just wanted to mention a couple of other cards that may be a little off the beaten path for players who are less familiar with what Teamer is looking like in CDH these days. For example, this deck is running both Conqueror's Flail and Dose on the Falling Leaf, both effects that have a lot of similarities to things like Grand Abolisher and other cards in the Silence family. We're not running white. Having a Silence effect can be a very potent way to guard our turn. Conqueror's Flail is a very responsible Silence. It costs 2 mana to play and 2 to equip, but once we have it equipped, we've basically turned that creature into a Grand Abolisher, which is fantastic. Dosen, I'm a little bit less enthusiastic about. I don't really like the idea of landing that and paying three mana to do so, and then possibly being stopped and passing the turn to somebody who is now protected by Dosen and the Falling Leaf. But it is the most efficient option that we have access to, and I am really not sold on Defense Grid. I think Dosen is the better choice over Defense Grid in this deck in particular. I could probably be pretty easily convinced, but for now, those are the includes that we have. I've also added a personal favorite in the form of Spellskite. Two mana for a 0-4 creature Phyrexian Horror with pay a Phyrexian Blue, which means you can pay with your blue mana or two life, to change the targets of target, ability, or spell into Spellskite. Now, it does still need to be a legal target, so you can't change the target of a counter spell to Spellskite, but it plays absolute havoc with people's interaction for permanence. It means that in order for somebody to successfully path to exile a key piece, they first have to get rid of the Spellskite. And bounce spells are basically wasted against this, since we can just recast it on our next turn for two. If opponents don't have two pieces of interaction to stop our game plan at that point, we can usually win fairly easily with that as a pseudo-silence effect. Another card I feel bears some explaining is Dryad's Revival. This is a green sorcery from Midnight Hunt for two and a green with Return Target Card from your graveyard to your hand. 
which is just a more expensive form of regrowth. But it has flashback for four and a green, which means that we can form an intuition tile with this card, even if we don't have access to the Fugitive Doctor's attack trigger. Intuition piles are a staple of many of the most powerful Underworld Breach decks. Our Breach recipe needs Underworld Breach in hand to cast, Lion's Eye Diamond in our hand or in our graveyard to cast normally or with your Breach, and either Brain Freeze or Grinding Station to fuel the escape costs. Once again, either in hand or graveyard, it doesn't really matter. Intuition by itself doesn't score the win because our opponents could choose to put Underworld Breach into our graveyard and give us one of Brain Freeze or Lion's Eye Diamond. But if we have any one of those pieces in hand, then Intuition can be used to tutor for the rest of the package. As an example, let's say that we already have Brain Freeze in hand, so our Intuition pile would be Dryad's Revival, Lion's Eye Diamond, and Underworld Breach. If our opponent gives us Lion's Eye Diamond, which I think is probably their most optimal play, we can still go off almost immediately by using Lion's Eye Diamond to help pay for the flashback cost of four and a green to get Underworld Breach back to hand, and then we can play Underworld Breach and start our combo turn. It is a very powerful effect to have. It kind of does a much more expensive impression of Sabine's Reclamation in Jeskai, which Yes, that's right, the white card is better, because the white card would put Underworld Breach directly into play. Still, Underworld Breach is that good, and this is worth the include. Surreal, thank you for taking the time to explain to me how this particular line worked. Just as a couple of other cards I want to mention before we start talking about mulligans. Final Fortune provides us the option to sneak in a win, quote-unquote, at instant speed, or can buy us a second combat step if we can't assemble our combos until the post-combat main phase, and we happen to be leaning on a card like Finale of Devastation to score our win. Goblin Engineer is another toolbox which opens up multiple lines. Goblin Engineer can entomb an important piece for us, and we are running cards like Imposter Mech and Cursed Mirror to advance our game plan using copies of our opponent's pieces. I'll also quickly mention that we are on Keenan Bonder Crodigy, which opens up some really interesting lines with Dockside Extortionist by cutting down the threshold cost for those loops basically in half, round it up. Also provides a really nice alternate outlet for Unbounded Mana if for some reason we're stuck behind a Dranith Magistrate or something like that. And importantly, all of the components of our necessary loop Deadeye Navigator, Teamer Sabertooth, and Dockside Extortionist are non-humans, so we can usually assemble a win just off of Keenan activations if we have no other option. The deck's not on Basalt Monolith right now, and it may be worth including, but we're not focused enough on Keenan quite yet to make that part of our game plan. Now, before we finish up the episode, it's time for everybody's favorite part of a CDH primer, talking about mulligans. Let's take a look at a few opening hands and discuss what we would do with them and what our opening plays would look like. So our first opening hand is Stomping Ground, Lion's Eye Diamond, Mana Confluence, Gaia's Cradle, Mox Amber, Phantasmal Image, and Simeon Spirit Guide. It's not a bad start. I think whether this hand is keepable or not really depends on what we're facing across the table. The most appealing line from this hand is to play K9, cast Mox Amber, and then cast Phantasmal Image with the blue from Mox Amber and pitching Simeon Spirit Guide. However, I really only like that in the scenario that an opponent cast a really nice value engine on turn one, or maybe on turn two. Alternatively, it could be really nice if our opponents land a strong stacks effect that we want to make sure does turn out to be symmetrical. Something like a Dranith Magistrate. That would be very nice to make sure we block our opponents out of being able to cast their commanders as well. I think I would ship this as the first seven in almost all cases, but I'd be more likely to consider it if I saw Thrasios in the command zone across from me, or if I saw somebody who was on a black and white inclusive deck that was going to be really leaning on value, as there are a lot of very fast plays in those colors that can generate a ton of advantage for a deck like ours. Let's go into our second opening hand now. So we have Wooded Foothills, Otawara, Soaring City, Swansong, Cyclonic Rift, Impostern Mech, Muddle the Mixture, and Elvish Spirit Guide. Okay, so from a hand that's got some quickness with no interaction to a hand that's got some interaction with no real quickness. 
Odawara into K9 feels a little bit rough, but there's also using Wooded Foothills to get our turn one land drop and then go fetch a Volcanic Island. Then use that one for a K9. We have a clone in hand just like before, so it sort of depends on what our opponents are doing. Playing K9 on turn one also kind of feels a little bit risky if we're thinking about interaction because we don't have any free interaction in hand with this. We could use the K9 play to bluff that we have free interaction in hand, but signaling to our opponents that we have free interaction by tapping out to play K9 and no rocks probably means they're going to pass priority on just about anything threatening over to us. And we're going to have to kind of scratch our heads and go, sorry guys, we lose. Again, I, I think in most pods, I would ship this as we don't get a really fast start and we're very reliant on our opponent's plans to get rolling. But if I was facing down against several people who looked like they may be turboing out, I would probably want to be responsible and keep a hand like this that has that fast interaction. Okay, on to hand number three. We have Taiga, City of Brass, Shatter Skull Smashing, Intuition, Pyroblast, Deflecting Swat, and Neoform. Now this, on the other hand, offers a lot of potential gas. Turn one, we have City of Brass into K9 holding up Deflecting Swat. On turn two, we have the ability to either potentially go for a fast Dockside combo off of Neoform, especially if our opponents have overloaded the board with rocks and enchantments. The thing that I don't like about this is that we would have to sacrifice K9 to play Neoform, and thus we're open to getting two for one by our opponents if they have a counterspell for Neoform. Now, if everyone is tapped out and they're really overloading their boards with Mana Rocks on turn one, it's potentially worth it. We would probably, in all but the most greedy situations, need to go for a Dockside on turn two, and then before our turn three during the end step, present an intuition pile with Dryad's Revival, Teamer Sabretooth, and Deadeye Navigator. Again, this is a hand that's dependent on what our opponents played out early. And if instead one of them played out a juicy value piece, like an early Crom or something, I really instead think this hand is better suited by neoforming K9 into a copy of that value engine vis-a-vis -vis Phantasmal Image. There's also the conservative line of using Neoform into Ledger Shredder and just start grinding some value the old-fashioned way to set up for a breach win with Intuition, which seems like it's probably the direction this hand wants to go over Dockside Extortionist. Overall, though, I really like this hand. There are some really interesting options, and our turn one top deck could completely change any one of these plans for the better. Okay, our fourth and final opening hand is Gemstone Caverns. Command Tower, Mana Vault, Mental Misstep, Fluster Storm, Transmute Artifact, and Mindbreak Trap. And I am very happy that we got this opening hand because it illustrates just how flexible this deck is having a one mana value artifact creature as our companion. I think that if we are in any seat other than seat number one, this hand has a lot of really juicy options. So we could potentially have Gemstone Caverns as our pre-game play, pitching either Fluster Storm or Mindbreak Trap to get things started. That allows us to, on turn one, play Command Tower, and then play both K9 and Mana Vault out. Then on turn two, we can tap those two lands for two blue mana to cast Transmute Artifact. And I think the correct choice here is to float three mana off of Mana Vault and then sacrifice it to go fetch the one ring, paying for the mana value difference that Transmute Artifact requires. This sets us up with an incredibly powerful value engine on turn number two, while still having K9 on board to represent interaction and to support us later once we start drawing into other potential lines with Neoform or Eldritch Evolution or even Birthing Pod. I like this because it really shows so much of the versatility of the deck. We do not need to rush for a fast Dockside Extortionist, we can instead go for an entirely different play where now we're the one ring deck and we are the value deck that our opponents are going to have to struggle to keep up with. The really nice part about this play is we can still protect it from one mana value interaction like Pyroblast or something like a Spell Pierce with our own mental misstep for free. And I think it's debatable whether the card to pitch in your opener to Gemstone Caverns is 
Mindbreak Trap or Flustered Storm. The more that I look at it, the more I think that Fluster Storm, you probably keep and you pitch Mind Break Trap just because I think that Mind Break Trap is going to do you less good than Fluster Storm in those earliest turns when you're trying to land a fast one ring. So there's the deck. What did you guys think about it? Again, huge thanks to Kai the Fervent Alchemist and Surreal for their help on the deck. If you want to see their takes on the decks, I've included links to their deck list below. And please check out Kai's video over on his channel, Fervent Alchemist where he breaks down the deck beautifully. You'll see that he leaned much more into the speed aspect of the deck, and it just goes to show how flexible this kind of deck can be. Please, send some love those creators way. They do fantastic work. But that about wraps it up for this particular deck list. If you got some questions about it, let us know in the comments on the CCO Media Group, where we are Gemstone Mine Podcast. You can add us on Twitter, where we are at Gemstone Mine MTG, or you can send us an email, gemstonemindpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mind.